welcome to That's Canon, a podcast talking about the Canon film series and other similar movies. This is episode 36, and I'm your host, Phil. And I'm Greg. And Greg, we are at our first Chuck Norris film with Canon. <laughs> that we are, yeah. And, and it's the start of, from what we can understand, you know, seeing some of those documentaries, uh, a long a long and loving relationship between between the actor and uh, in Canon. I mean, do you think the actor Chuck Norris would ever turn down a film company? I'm, <laughs> I think this is one of his first leading roles in a movie. Yeah, I think, yeah. They, from from what little I know, I, did, did Canon just like, were they were the ones to give him his shot? Like he was probably looking to break into the film industry as like a, oh, he sees what Arnold Schwarzenegger does and I could do that. And yeah, he just probably was trying to shop himself around, and they were the one who gave him a shot. And he had a few other ones before this, like Lone Wolf McQuaid and others. But this is probably the big movie that really put him on the public eye, right? <laughs> for better or worse, <laughs> yeah, for better or for worse, as we'll as we'll get into. I mean, he is. He's no Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's no Sylvester Stallone. He just, yeah. What do you we'll think? We'll get into why, but. What do you, uh, let's, what, what do you think Carlos Ray Norris, also known as Chuck, uh, when you see him on screen, <laughs> what do you think when you see him? Um, wet blanket <laughs> comes to mind. Um, mannequin comes to mind. He just is he's just so lacking in charisma that you almost need, like he probably thinks to himself, Oh, it's an action movie. I don't really need to say a whole lot. I'm just going to be shooting guns and punching dudes. And, and this, this kind of movie really shows why, even though that is maybe on the surface, what an action movie is in a lot of ways, you still need kind of character charisma. You need to be able to emote and, these are all things that the good action stars from this era all do really well, even though they're not, maybe not talking a whole lot. It, it still somehow comes across on camera. And I, I can't, I don't know if I could put my finger on why, but whatever it, it is, Chuck Norris does not have it. And I find it so interesting too, because he was given a TV show. He was forced to act, <laughs> right? Um, he, was he was forced on the American people. He was Walker, Texas Ranger for years, right? I think that show yeah. went on for like eight years. A, a long time, yeah. It, was that Did that come after this? That was like a 90s thing. Yeah, it? Walker, Texas Ranger was debuted September 25th, 1993 and ended May 19th, 2001. Yeah, I, I maybe maybe that was just his niche. A, a, a kind of like a serialized TV show. It wasn't really serialized. It was kind of like a. I I, I, I didn't watch a lot of Walker Texas Ranger. That was always one of those shows that was on on USA as a kid, and I would maybe like catch the end of it because I think like X Files probably came on after it or something. Yeah, something I wanted to watch. <laughs> the most the the biggest thing that I remember from Walker Walker Texas Ranger is from um, Conan, the talk show host, and he would randomly play. A clip of the kids saying walker told me i have aids <laughs> which you'll hear right now i don't you always how you say it in cherokee oh well pardon my french but uh, i'll be damned <laughs> walker told me i have aids um yeah oh Haley joel osmond <laughs> Haley joel osmond probably fresh off of his sixth sense debut on an episode of Walker, Texas Ranger goes, oh. Walker told me I have AIDS. Walker told me I have AIDS. Oh, <laughs> Haley Josman, no. I know, right? That's so, it's so weird. Um, that's, just, I guess that's just the kind of show that, that works for the Chuck Norris, I'll say personality, but I feel like that's being charitable. I don't know. I, yeah, that's, we, we let's start talking about the movie. We'll, 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 we'll see why, but I just, he's, he just does not have action like the Arnold Schwarzenegger type action ch hero chops. Uh, well, let's get into it. So the movie opens, we get a, that beautiful Canon logo, but it's, it's obscured with the sounds of war coming from behind it. Sounds of helicopters, helicopters. and, uh, and gunfire. 
And I was, I was really, uh, I guess, I don't know if the word is impressed or shocked by how boring the beginning <laughs> credits are. Uh, it's just names popping up and uh, like some of the other Canon films, they had snazzy intro credits or they did interesting things with it. Like the Ninja series. Right. Yeah. Cause I think the, the Ninja movies, they, they, the beginning scene starts with the credits kind of overlaid onto them so that, you know, maybe, I mean, they could have done that here too, where they showed, I mean, they could have, they could have extended the scene that we got after the credits where he, there are the kind of, it's an, like an action scene in the jungle. Just, just add a little bit more of that. Give me something to watch while I'm watching these names roll by. Yes. Uh, but as we finally get past all the names we're in, I'm assuming on location Vietnam. Yeah, that was actually one of the big pluses of this whole movie for me is that they, they clearly shot, if not in Vietnam, but on location somewhere in Southeast Asia, because it looks it looks awesome. It's very jungle. You know, it's, it's got that great jungle look to it. So it's I'm assuming they went somewhere. Yeah. Um, but as the uh, as the intro is is going, it's it's just Chuck Norris somehow surviving explosion after explosion after explosion <laughs> but uh, literally everyone else is dying of around him as the <laughs> as the vietnamese are mortar shelling and yeah. just mowing people down left and right it, 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 we have to talk a little bit about chuck norris's look because you know how in i think this is like a joke that people make about anime shows where the, the main character just sticks out because they've got such a different look compared to everyone around them. They've got like colorful hair or, yeah. or some weird costume or something. He look Chuck Norris in this looks so different from the other like rank and file soldiers getting blown away all around him. Chuck Norris has his mop top and beard going on, totally <laughs> was, out of army regulations. I'm so happy you touch on that because I was gonna, I actually wrote this down. It's like question for Phil: Would someone ever get away with having hair as long as Chuck Norris is in this movie? If, if in the military. Were... If you were just like standard issue military dude uh, walking around on base, you'd get your shit handed to you so quick for having hair and facial <laughs> hair like this. Now, during times of war, I, I'm pretty sure they're lax, but there's no way that when he like returns to base, someone is going to be like, you need to get a fucking haircut and they're going to shave his ass. Yeah, it, it's so I mean, I guess it's that style that kind of mop tops, like you said, that was stylish then. But yeah, there's no there's no way it's so and and it's also super clean and shiny yes. too, <laughs> nicely, freshly washed. He he definitely used his head and shoulders while everyone else <laughs> looks like smashed ass. <laughs> they look like they're fighting a war and it looks like Chuck yeah. Norris is just there around out of the shower yeah like they're all there yeah like you said they're like they're all gross and grimy and bloody and dirty and just greasy and nasty and he's over here like yeah he looks like he walked out of a head and shoulders commercial yeah he's like picking people up and running with them and then realizing that they're dead and he puts them back on the ground it's just it's like five minutes of chuck norris being the gallant in quotes beautiful hero while people just die around him um I will Very say cornball. at the six minute mark, Chuck Norris looks at someone and I called him Buck Norris because I thought they were going to be buddies because Buck Norris gives Chuck a thumbs up and I saw thumbs up and Chuck kind of like nods at him and then the dude gets blown away. <laughs> <laughs> immediately after that thumbs up we get just enough time to get exchange that glance like two two hulking bros yeah nodding to each other yeah you got that guy and then he immediately just gets blown away and that's um, what, that's what the intro is it's just chuck looking at people them getting killed i'm like damn it chuck stop looking at everyone <laughs> stop looking at people is he killing these dudes um this it, it you know it, it just occurred to me that this that part where Buck Norris gets shot we were thinking like wow that would a like what a cool looking eighties dude he's got a mullet yeah he he also is kind of stood stood apart from the rest of the guys because he's got like a slightly different look going on you think oh he's gonna be a cool side character and then the movie immediately dispatches them and you never see them again yeah nothing so many awesome side characters in this movie. You There's, hear a great line, a goofy line, and they just get dispatched with no afterthought. The intro is is full of that. There's yeah, as the helicopters the helicopters are starting to land, the army is retreating. 
there's still like a Vietnamese infantryman in a bunker with a, a machine gun just mowing people down. Yeah. And Chuck is working with other army people, but they just they just get wiped away. Uh, <laughs> they are cannon fodder. It's insane. And there's there's a moment after Chuck uh like lobs a grenade which okay by the way <laughs> grenades don't work that way grenades when you throw them they don't create create giant fiery explosions no it's like packed full of metal and the metal shoots out and stabs you at high velocity yeah they're a little, little fr- like what do they call them pineapple grenades we had yeah. the same conversation in have had it in so many episodes because so many of these bad action movies do that where like you said they create these little little pineapple grenades create these giant fireballs yeah it's it's so absurd yeah and this one like destroys that whole bunker yeah so chuck overhand tosses he never would have made it those things are pretty heavy (laughs) um blows up a bunker and then he notices that there's two american army soldiers they're getting razzed by the vietnamese and they're getting stabbed like, like the Vietnamese guy is just kind of just poking them over and over again. It's pretty brutal too. It They're is like screaming and crying, and he's just like going to town with that bayonet. Uh, Chuck rips off two grenades from his chest, pops the pins, <laughs> and jumps and explodes. And I was like, I was looking at my wife who was watching this with me. I was like, Are you fucking kidding me? Did did the movie just end? And then it was a dream <laughs> sequence. Which, like, <sighs> I can... Okay, that's fine. Like, he's having PTSD, right? That's sure, cool. Yeah. Maybe this was real and fictionalized reaccounting of something that Chuck went through. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Um, But as Chuck awakes, Chuck awakens, we see his bear, grizzly hairy chest <laughs> yeah for the first time first of many bare chested scenes we get thrust upon us i will say this i always thought chuck norris maybe this is later years chuck norris was kind of dumpy uh he does <laughs> have a physique it is not that of stallone or schwarzenegger but he does have a look that seems to be achievable by almost human anyone standards. which is normal human yeah that's actually a really good point he doesn't have that sort of over tanked like bodybuilder look that Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of popularized for for action stars he he definitely looks more like a normal dude yeah maybe his maybe his dumpy dad bod years were Walker Texas Ranger could be <laughs> um and as he awakens we hear Spider-Man on the TV yeah. and I was way more interested in the episode that was going on because he was fighting the shocker, which is a very underrated villain. Um, but it was really weird because this, <laughs> this five minute scene and it's, it's pretty long. Uh, it's like one extended take. To, it's like one shot. We see him, like you said, he, he kind of wakes up and he walks across his apartment to a, to the kitchen yeah. and walks back. It's like five minutes and you're, <laughs> and we're hearing the Spider-Man TV episode going through this entire thing and i'm just sitting there going like the movie is an hour and 40 minutes why are we padding this out you know Um, major time waster for sure but as chuck norris looks into the distance he gets another ptsd flashback he's back in vietnam uh running away from mortar shells as uh we we notice one vietnamese general and it's important to note this as he is a bad guy uh and then we kind of go back to reality and what's really (laughs) weird is chuck is still silent i don't think he's really said anything the entire film so far even i don't even think even in the flashbacks right yeah he's just kind of looking at the camera and grunting and thumbs up and dudes who get blown away and but not saying a word and then the movie cuts and shows part of the Spider-Man cartoon. Now, uh, my hypothesis is that this is a subliminal test to see if people are interested to see Spider-Man on the big screen oh. because Canon around this time owned the rights to Spider-Man. No, are you shitting me? I am I'm not messing with you. Wow. Um Spider-Man owned the, or Canon owned the rights to Spider-Man and planned planned to make 
the Spider-Man movie in the mid 1980s. This movie came out in 1984. Wow, they paid that... two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars for the rights. Wow. I mean, so I, I, I know very small bits of Marvel history. Wasn't Marvel really struggling financially at this point? Yes. And that's why they sold it. Yeah, right. They, they were just selling their property left and right uh, in order to, to, wow. to try to. To, to, you know, to make it big. In yeah. fact, Canon was so confident in their ability to get a Spider-Man movie off the ground. They made a poster for it. Now I'm going to go really? ahead. And I'm going to send it oh, to you. Oh yeah, please send. I've not seen this right now. Um, and you can see it says the legend, oh, the legendary no. <laughs> comic book. Here comes alive in his greatest adventure, the year of Canon Spider-Man. Jeez, that's like. This is like hearing a story about those guys who have like a hard drive full of Bitcoin that they threw away and it's sitting like the, the like the multi-million dollar hard drive is sitting in a dump somewhere because they they didn't know what they had before it became valuable. Yep. Can you like can you imagine the alternate universes where canon still exists and they they, <laughs> they tried to spearhead the Marvel Cinematic Universe it's, through Spider-Man? It's insane to think that this could have been uh that the saved first them. it could have who knows Wow, what, that's that's a really interesting bit of trivia, and I think that's a really great theory too. Like trying to pepper in a little bit of Spider-Man, kind of, hey, we've got this property. Let's kind of throw that in there a little bit. We may as well, yeah, pepper it in there, get people intrigued about the potential yeah. of seeing Spider-Man on the big screen. Yeah, right? they, they, that's that's what that that's what something like this would do. It would do like kind of like in the back of your mind, like, oh, remember Spider-Man? Oh, I remember that TV show. Wouldn't it be cool to see that in the movie? And then you would you'd walk out of missing an action, feeling sad. But then you'd be like, "Oh, Spider Man, that's gonna come out soon next year or in, in two years." Exactly. You're onto something there, Phil. That's that's genius. So, it doesn't end there. Actor Scott <laughs> Leva was picked by Canon Films to star in the Spider Man film, and it was going to be directed by Toby Hooper of Texas Chainsaw fame. Wow, that would be bonkers. And are you ready for this? No. Here's some promo images of the actor as Spider-Man and Peter Parker. They actually did costume tests. He looks like a good Spider-Man. Yeah. Wow. That's 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 is really disappointing. I, I know we're this is a hard tangent from Mission in Action, but this is I'm fascinated by this as a potential like alternate universe where Canon made a Spider-Man movie. See, here's the the really depressing thing about that is you know it would have bombed though because of how badly they botched Superman 4, right? Yeah. They, they would have dumped a ton of budget into it. They would realize that they're horribly ill-equipped. I mean, maybe Toby Hooper could have done something with it, but I wow. feel really bad for this Scott Leva guy because while he still has credits as a stunt man and stunt coordinator, this very well could have been his big break and it just big fell break, through. Yeah. I mean, imagine like while this could have easily been Superman four, it also could have been like 1989 Batman. Like this could have been the start of the, that 90s era of comic book movies, like good ones, potentially. Who knows? Uh, yeah, it's weird. It, it is extremely weird. Um, well, you know, I, I it's funny you bring all this up because when I when we were seeing Spider-Man playing on the TV in, in Missing in Action, I was thinking like we're seeing so much of it that makes me think like, did they just own the rights to this and they're really getting their money's worth? Cause we see like five minutes of this cartoon. Yeah. Now that's all kind of, it all makes sense now, Phil. There you wow. go. Uh, so the reason why the Spider-Man movie failed to ever swing through the air was <laughs> Canon execs Golan and Globus were under the impression that Spider-Man was a monster horror property. And turned to Leslie Stevens, who is a writer from The Outer Limits, to write a script where Peter Parker basically becomes a giant human tarantula. What? Yeah. Oh, no. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Did no one tell these guys? Like, nah, nah man. He, he's like a superhero. He's like Superman, but spider. You know that, right? Exactly. I don't know. The what was nice. going on there uh 
they tried again to make another Spider-Man film with James Cameron. Uh, and that failed for many of reasons, mainly because it was going to be R rated and we could go into this forever. Uh, <laughs> also why? Yeah. Uh, we can talk about that another day. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I, well, last thing I'll say on that, I would love to see an R rated Spider-Man movie uh, where Spider-Man actually kills the crooks. Yes. It would be interesting to, <laughs> to say the least. Oh man. Uh, it's more interesting than missing an action. It is right. Uh, so Chuck Norris, he's he's intensely watching the Spider-Man film and probably because he's studying to be the role for J. Jonah Jameson. Who knows? That's just that's just me oh hypothesizing. God, that would have been awesome. <laughs> that's just me hypothesizing. <laughs> uh, and then Chuck Norris picks up a phone and just says, I'm coming. And I'm coming. you don't know who he's talking to. The conversation is spurred by nothing and no one. It's just a random piece of dialogue that doesn't make sense until the next scene in which Chuck Norris is on a Air Force airplane. And I guess there's some like state senators talking and they're going to Saigon to talk about POWs. And we finally figure out what Chuck Norris's name is in the film 15 minutes into it. It's Braddock. And oh, geez, I'm amazed you remember that he is firmly Chuck Norris in all of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Very forgettable name. And uh, these senators are disillusioned with Braddock or Chuck Norris. We'll just call him Chuck. Uh, disillusioned with Chuck because he looks like a normal dude who isn't in the army anymore, which is fine because he's not. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they're going to go have some POW talks. Right. Yeah. They're, they're flying to Vietnam. Cause I guess there's like a whole issue of people are up in arms thinking that there's POW still left over from the Vietnam war. I mean, this is years later and I guess they're going to some kind of hearings with the Vietnamese government to sort of like put the issue to bed and show like, no, there's no more. This is an official response from our government we're, we're, we're done with it. And I, and they're bringing Chuck Norris. Why? I think because he's going to, attest to that there is still uh pow's in vietnam it's a really convoluted plot um, yeah but as as chuck norris leaves the the plane he meets james hong woo james hong two movies in a row yes which i did you know that james hong is from was born in minneapolis minnesota <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah. That's awesome. That's... What a what a like dude, like more power to you. Like making a career out of playing any any Asian ethnicity, he he nails everything he's into. Yes. And he and he nails accents really well too. Uh he's been in over six hundred television and film roles. Man, what a boss. That's awesome. I was so excited to see him show up. He sh- you see his name in the credits too. Like, ooh, I wonder when he's gonna show up. Yes. He's awesome. I love him. Uh and there, there's some strife between Lopan and Chuck. Uh, I mean, James Hong, as uh, as they get off the plane, <laughs> you can tell that Chuck is not interested in dealing with with James Hong because he's like a he's like a Vietnamese general, I guess. Yeah, he's wearing a military uniform, so I assume he's some ranking military official. But he it could have also just been like, I don't know if he was like the prime minister or something. Two, uh, it was kind of confusing what his role was. As Chuck is walking to his car, he sees in the distance the evil Vietnamese general that he saw in the flashback. And then we got another flashback where <sighs> Chuck Norris is getting uh, tortured. He has a knife slid across his chest. Uh, very don't much... forget the part where we where he rips his shirt off and we see Chuck Norris's chest again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he comes up and rips his shirt. <laughs> cuts him you don't see the cut you just see the blood on his feet but chuck doesn't give him the time of day he doesn't react to being cut um again this has probably happened to people but if we're looking at it from a purely cinematic perspective this blatantly rips off first blood in which john j rambo sylvester sloan has pretty much the same exact flashback except Instead of being a stoic, silent asshole, Stallone <laughs> acts 
and gives into the pain and screams yeah. and it, it causes an emotional reaction. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you don't want, even though it's like, sounds cool on paper to have like, Oh, I'm a badass action hero. Even though I'm getting sliced and diced with a sharp knife, I'm not going to show any emotion. I'm just going to stare that guy down. Like it's, that does not forge any connections with the audience. Oh, exactly. Unlike what you said. Yeah. Where you're, you're, you're emoting. Basically you feel for Sylvester Stallone. I'm sure I would, uh, I would be screaming, but yeah, uh, yeah. Chuck just kind of gives them the stank guy. Uh, and, <laughs> and then we transition to a, like a state building and they're having a news conference. And James Hong is essentially like uh, James J. Braddock is a war criminal. He wasn't a POW. Uh, we've returned all the POWs. Braddock was uh, essentially arrested and put in jail. And they bring in some farmers from Vietnam who have given sworn affidavits that James J. Braddock is a war criminal. And this causes right. Chuck Norris to like look them in the eye. And they all like meekishly stare down as if admitting their guilt. Yeah. What was that? What, what, was that like, I mean, not, not to say anything about him just standing up in the middle of this hearing and walking over to these people and no one does anything about it, but was that them? Was it the, the the farmers that they brought in? Was it that they were like lying? That they were they were they probably yeah the Davids and they were like ashamed of it. Hey, it's, yeah, they they probably felt shame that they're throwing some white dude they've never seen <laughs> under the bus. I was like, why would they give a shit? They probably got paid to do this. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> it's interesting, but yeah, Braddock is is or Chuck is very. Uh, insistent that there are still POWs somewhere yes. in Vietnam. Uh, now, actually, Robert R. Garwood was often cited as the last American POW from the Vietnam War. And he was taken to North Vietnam in 1969 and wasn't released until 1973. However, he didn't return to the United States until March 22nd, 1979. So Jeez. what was he doing in the intervening years after being, I guess, out of the POW camp, but still in country? So he was listed as having volunteered or being forced into a work group repairing a generator uh, in northern Vietnam. He was not a POW. He was now <laughs> in forced labor ship. I was like, like that's a, that sounds worse. <laughs> that's that's tap dancing around the word slave, I think. Yeah, um, right. Hey, you know generators, you're going to stay here now, right? Yeah. They said, you know, pointing a gun at him. It's interesting. Jeez. But that's a long time, yeah. It is a long time. Uh but back to the movie, <laughs> <laughs> which is not nearly as interesting as actual history. Yeah. So after Chuck does the awkward stare down, we get this they go to like a party where Chuck essentially threatens every Vietnamese person he sees with death. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, it's very, I won't say it's anti-Vietnamese, but maybe it was just the state of America in filmmaking at the time. But I find it odd that they don't have a Vietnamese character that Chuck works with, um, you know, kind of like creates a bond at yeah. first he mistrusts them because of the Vietnam war, but over time they learn to work with each other and enjoy each other's company. Exactly. Someone to help Chuck Norris kind of get over this kind of like prejudice that he probably has against all Vietnamese people that he came in with and just like showing him kind of getting over that by having someone, yeah, like a buddy who he trusts and helps him out and sacrifices himself. Maybe you yep. need that in a movie like this to kind of have him have Chuck Norris grow, but now nope, he just hates everyone. So <laughs> uh, Chuck is going up to his room with one of the women state senators. It, it, I thought she would have played a bigger role in the movie, but she's really yeah. only there to supply like two scenes, which is uh, the two scenes that are coming up. So yeah. Chuck Norris makes a spectacle of going to her room because he wants to make sure that people know that he is going to be in there, right? Yeah, he, there, there, there's like two kind of like uh, goons who kind of tail him back to the hotel. He wants to make sure that they saw him go into her room. 
Um, and that's where Chuck gets down into his underwear. And though the woman's kind of like, I only wanted mm. to have a drink. And then Chuck gets into his tactical gear and he's like, I'm going to do some night investigation. In Sue's like the worst hitman uh, Assassin's Creed moment <laughs> that just yeah. takes way too fucking long forever yeah i mean it's like it was cool for a couple seconds when you see because it was clearly a stunt guy kind of scaling the outside of these really nice old facades buildings but it like it just goes on forever Mm -hmm. and nothing happens he's successful he any opposition that he meets he beats it with no no issue no effort, no risk, really. Like, there's, yeah. there's, that's why there's there's no risk because he he just does everything so effortlessly. So there's no tension. As he's scaling the the scaffolding or the building, uh, he eventually fucking gets off the building and sneaks into the the Vietnamese <laughs> night, uh, where he gets to a compound of James Hong. Uh, as he deftly sneaks in. I, what I love, though, is that he's he's dressed in, like, black. He's in his tech gear, right? Yeah. But he has fucking blonde hair. So he looks <laughs> like a shadow except for his face. <laughs> this this floating, blonde-headed, blue-eyed dude. Yeah. Uh, it's, so, it's so weird. I understand you don't want to hide your action star. But come on. For, like, a few moments, you can do that. Chuck yeah. probably didn't cost that much money. No. Like, put at least put on... Put on one of those like like a black cap or something, or put on some grease paint, something yeah. to try and you know disguise that yeah that bright blonde hair of yours. But no. <laughs> but uh, he he does sneak into James Hong's uh, bedroom, um, and this at this point, <laughs> Jackie looks at me and she says, "I think the movie should be called Missing the Action because this is boring." <laughs> Oh my god, that is genius. Yes. Missing the egg. Uh <laughs> and uh so <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Chuck is uh he, at knife point, he's he's pressuring James Hong to give up the information of where the American POWs are, which yeah. James gives up, and then as Chuck like turns him over and puts him like face forward onto his bed, and he was like, if you scream, I'll kill you. And yeah. then as, as Chuck is trying to leave the bedroom, James has his bed gun, which everyone as knows. Do. Everyone has yeah. a bed gun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, under, the, under that pillow loaded with the safety off. <laughs> yeah. Right next to his head. <laughs> uh, he, he cracks. Achoo, bang. <laughs> exactly. He cracks a shot at Chuck. He misses. Chuck throws the knife and kills him. <sighs> I was no. so shocked that James Hong dies so quickly I in this movie. Too. I thought for sure he would be the big evil bad general who is, you know, behind the whole thing, like hiding the, the POWs. And it's such a waste. He's such an awesome actor. It is a waste. Uh, it is a waste to have to introduce your villain literally 10 minutes ago and then just kill him. Yeah. And, and at this point, we are so. We, you mentioned it earlier. We we've had two kind of main villains introduced so far: James Hong, who is now dead, yes, and the other general who we saw in the flashback, and then again as he was getting uh, Chuck Norris was getting off the plane. Yes, we're not. We're just keep make a mental note of that, listeners. That <laughs> we've got we've dispatched half of our plausible big bad villains. Exactly. See how long this next one lasts? Uh, there's a there's a a slight action scene where Chuck is punching people left and right. Uh, but he's on the breakneck speed to get back to the hotel because everyone's on the loose and they're looking for Braddock. And yes. th- that person who's looking for him is the uh, Vietnamese general and all of his goons. Again, no tension. <laughs> Chuck Norris gets into the mm-hmm. hotel room with just like a few moments to spare. And I kid you not, Greg, as he has, as Chuck Norris was going back into the the window of his hotel room, I looked at Jack and I was like, he's going to rip her dress off and they're going to act like they're having sex, <laughs> which is exactly what Chuck Norris does. He rips his shirt off, rips the state senator senator's dress off. They get into bed and they start acting like they're having sex. Enters yeah. 
the Vietnamese general. And he's like, I bet you he's been here the entire night. How convenient. <laughs> How convenient. Uh, and then he's like, I want you out of Vietnam <laughs> tomorrow, which I didn't know that he had the ability to do that. But who am I? Uh, yeah, like he's like, you get out tomorrow or you don't leave at all. Yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, seeing their military force, I, I, I'd I believe it. That's a credible threat. Yeah. I mean, this they, they as we just saw, the entire like city is crawling with these soldiers and there's, you know, two dozen of them surrounding the building. Um. So that's what uh, Chuck Norris does. He gets the fuck out of Dodge and he he goes to Bangkok. Yeah, to Thailand. Wait, why Another... Bangkok? I got to see a friend. Reasons. Now, when you <laughs> yeah, reasons, <laughs> you go to Bangkok for reasons. Um, when when he said that, I need to see a friend. I I expected. And we won't give it away right now, but I expected someone age appropriate for Chuck Norris. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, like a, like a war buddy in his kind of a, a contemporary. Yes. Uh, so Braddock goes to Bangkok, and he is still being tailed by two Vietnamese goons. We'll just call them. Right. Uh, as Chuck Norris gets into the nightlife of Bangkok. <sighs> You hear music, and I thought we were about to get a fucking break dancing scene. Oh yeah, the weird. I mean, the music in this movie never seems to match the scene, but this one definitely didn't. It, it was exactly like it was ripped out of Breakin'. Yes, in fact, I looked at Jackie and I was like, Breakin' Two is the next movie. That's why we're about to have a break dance sequence <laughs> right now, and it just never happened. No, you know that that Thai bank that 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 Bangkok uh, um, break dancing scene is just is on fire. Exactly, they love it there. Uh, Braddock is going from bar to bar, paying off uh, bar keeps to find Jack Tucker, his uh, American friend, we'll say. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he finally gets some information that she, he's going to be at this uh, whorehouse, essentially. As, as Braddock is walking through the streets of Bangkok, <laughs> he doesn't hail a taxi. A taxi just appears out of nowhere and Chuck just gets inside of it as if he <laughs> called for the taxi yeah right like the i i guess good timing maybe it's, but yeah it looked like it was called for him uh it's one of the vietnamese cronies and he's got a newspaper pistol and he tries to shoot chuck norris chuck norris is able to essentially beat the shit out of him while they're driving he crashes the car into another car and Chuck kills him by like snapping his neck. But Very what I loved was this like. gag. It, uh, just as as Chuck leaves, a Vietnamese couple gets into the taxi as if nothing <laughs> happened. <laughs> we, like the, okay, the the taxi is clearly just like totaled yes. in this alley, and the guy is dead on the inside. Yeah. Why, why would you get into this taxi? It's such an odd. It's an uh. odd joke, and I don't see how the writer or the director after they got done shooting it went, this works. This is gold. Like cut that out. That's weird. And I mean, I'm glad they left it in because this, the, the movie is at this point, like as soon as he got to Thailand, the movie started getting interesting because we got weird things like this. Yes. But yeah, what a strange choice. Uh, eventually Chuck Norris gets to the whorehouse that he's looking for in which a, what, what do you call someone from Thailand? Like, you know, they're American, Vietnamese. A Thai? Thai. Wow, what the fuck? <laughs> How did I not think of that? <laughs> My father-in-law, his wife is Thai. Um, there's a there's a Thai woman uh, singing Rod Stewart, if you think I'm sexy, and it's horrible. Yeah. Uh, but like it really we, sets the tone. It's it, It's like... Not only is she a terrible singer, but the the there's like no backing instrumentation except for like a carnival organ grinder. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing ever. Like, uh, not not strip club music because, but of course there are like fully nude women also dancing to this weird Rod Stewart cover. Yes, you see butts all <laughs> over this scene, just butts, butts um, left and right, man. It's so weird. Even Jackie was like kind of caught off guard that you don't see the boobs <laughs> you just see butts you just see butts like what kind of strip club is this it's it's i can't 
I'm not overselling this when there's probably like six different sets of butts that you get to see. Uh, I don't th- I don't think we've seen. I mean, you know, it's a canon movie. Normally we'll have seen boobs at some point, but yeah. I don't think we've seen any at this point. Just butts. Just butts. <laughs> Weird canon movie. Maybe uh, Joe Zito's an ass man. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're on to something there. Joe Zito, come on down to that's canon. I, I would love to Let talk to him. Uh, Chuck <laughs> Norris gets to the owner of the whorehouse and he's like, where's Jack Tucker? And she goes, he'll be dropping in any moment. And he literally drops from the rafters onto the table. And for some reason, like, was he fighting with someone upstairs and he fell off the balcony? Like, what happened? I'm assuming he owes someone money. And yeah, there was like a fight. Uh, okay, like a little, like a bar, a whorehouse rumble, as as you do. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, hmm. We come to realize that Jack Tucker is the perpetually old as fuck M. Emmett Walsh, who yes. is still alive. He's eighty six. He was born in nineteen thirty five. He was old in nineteen eighty four, which means he's <laughs> fucking ancient today. <laughs> He looks old in this too. Like that's why you said earlier that you think it's gonna be a war buddy who would be he he wasn't a POW, but he stayed in the country for whatever reason yeah. to make a living. And yeah, you think he's gonna be a war buddy his age, but no, it's like this old looking dude, this giant, like he's a giant guy in general, but he's got this like wild gray hair. Yeah, it's how so does he know weird. this guy? I don't that exactly it doesn't make any sense to me. It makes <laughs> no sense that M. Emmett Walsh would have been in Vietnam fighting. Yeah. Yeah, they clearly didn't they couldn't have met during the war. He would have been old during the war too. Yeah. I don't know. So anyways, uh maybe they're maybe they're pen pals. <laughs> the pen pals. <laughs> I I love to see that. <laughs> Chuck Norris <laughs> writing letters to MM. Have Walsh. you seen that new episode of Spider-Man? <laughs> I think I could be a J. Jonah Jameson. Um XOXO Chucky. Chucky. Do you think <laughs> do you think Chuck goes by Chucky? If you ever met him, would you go, hey Chucky? Hey Chucky. He would just kick the shit out of you. So M. Emmett Walsh is 86 right now. <laughs> Chuck Norris is 81. There's actually only five years difference between these two men. What? That's insane. It, uh, good for you, Chuck Norris, because you looked great in 84 compared to this guy yeah. for only like a five, six year difference. <laughs> M.M. Walsh looked like he went through the fucking ringer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he actually was living in Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> drinking bad water and Emmett, uh, we need you to act. Oh shit. You look old. Huh? How'd you find me? <laughs> Time has not been good to me. Um, <laughs> so they, as there's a fight ensuing, Chuck Norris is fighting people. He's haggling for the price of M. Emmett Walsh's boat that he wants to rent. They finally yeah. get down to the price of $1,000. Because who the fuck cares? Uh, yeah, we transition to the next day where we get introduced to the boat. Uh, it's kind of like the Millennium Falcon. It looks like shit, but it's really fast and it's got weapons on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, we get the, like, we. it's weird. They make so much... They put so much emphasis on how fast the boat can go. Like we see him, you know, the old guy showing Chuck Norris the engines for some reason. Yeah, it never 650 comes up again. horsepower. They can hit 21 knots if they need to. Ooh. I don't know what a I knot is. <laughs> you're, you're not a Navy man, folks. No. Air Force guy. 21 knots is only 24 miles per hour. Is that fast? I guess we're faster than that. That's insane. That seems really <laughs> slow. <laughs> couple i i guess maybe that that this scene was in there just for like there's like one boat enthusiast on the crew maybe joe zito was a boat guy yeah he just wanted to put a look at that boat engine <laughs> the ss ass is his the, uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the ss apple bottom apple body because <laughs> joe would he would have more uh he, he'd be a little more um uh highfalutin because he's a hollywood director the he's ss hollywood apple director. bottom <laughs> Oh, poor Josino. Uh, so as Chuck and Walsh are talking about the boat, uh, they, they come to the conclusion that they're going to need more weapons and another smaller boat. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I guess because he says like that's that the big boat is to get from Thailand back over to a spot on the Vietnamese coast. 
but then I guess the where he's where the POW camp is, it's up like a river delta. So you need he needs like a dinghy or something. To, yeah, to get there. So that's what they do. They go into the middle of the night to to find a Kevlar reinforced dinghy that can withstand a man wildly shooting an AK forty seven at it <laughs> at like point blank range. Yes. Uh Chuck Norris gets into the boat and he he arms the M forty assault rifle. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so awesome. <laughs> and he starts to haggle with the owner of the boat. Uh, as he loads the gun, he gets the price down to $1,000, in which Jackie goes, where the fuck is he getting all this money from? <laughs> he's like, <laughs> oh, it's genius. Yeah, he's, I mean, he. we saw the shithole apartment he was living in when he was watching Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Where is he getting, yeah, where is he getting all this money from? Does he? Is he like Harry Potter where he lives really meager, but he's got like a, He's got like a vault of gold, Vietnamese like war gold. Vietnamese gringots. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's really weird when movies like this start throwing in scenes of haggling because it happens again. Yeah. And you're just kind of like, why the fuck do I care about this? I don't even know how Chuck Norris makes money right now, let alone like there seems to be no tension in the haggling. Or... Yeah, no, like he's he's there, there's not he's not at risk of not getting the tools he needs. He exactly. just throw thousand dollars. No, total thousand. Fine, whatever. Yeah. It's it, like no problem for him. It's not impressive and it's not cool. But anyways, uh You know what it reminded me of? That scene in the new Mortal Kombat movie where Sonya Blade is haggling with Kano about how much that she's gonna pay him to to go along with their thing to the desert. Yeah. And and he's like and and Camel's he's like where'd you gonna get all that money she's like i don't even got that money I'll, i'm not gonna pay him yeah exactly <laughs> it's like we need a scene like that where chuck norris is like i ain't got no money yeah, he's I'm like gonna get paid later he's like writing bogus checks <laughs> it's all gonna the check's gonna bounce anyway man um and we transition to a vietnamese guy just walking into a room and then it cuts back to chuck norris haggling with a french guy a he needs a long range helicopter as opposed to a short range one. I, I don't know the difference. Um, and it doesn't really matter. He hires a helicopter as yeah. Chuck Norris goes back to his hotel room. That random Vietnamese guy is actually hiding inside of Chuck Norris's apartment <laughs> and in the armoire. I will say this when Chuck Norris throws him out of the window, because he dispatches him extremely quickly. Yeah, of course the, uh stunt double hits his head on that like tin roof yeah really hard like it hits out like it was yeah i'm glad you brought that up that was a great stunt and it's you see him jump through what i assume is like sugar glass he he does like a roll on the roof he's like on the second floor and he hits his head like on the roof in the gutter on his way rolling off the roof it looked really painful yes but it was, it was an awesome stunt regardless um, as he dispatches it, Chuck Norris looks out into the distance where he sees the evil Vietnamese general yes. who has a crony with him who has a, a grenade launcher and they shoot a grenade launcher at Chuck Norris and he deftly dodges the explosion. Which, I mean, we say explosion, it practically blows the whole second floor off of this hotel. Yeah. And yet somehow Chuck Norris comes out without a scratch. But there's people on the streets <laughs> literally like holding their face blood pouring out freaking Riding out Riding in pain screaming they're like they're wounded kids yeah i was about to say there's like really kids. horrifying there's like dead kids and stuff yes yeah, like jesus movie and chuck is and, he has a little bit of dirt on his chest yeah he's just like Whoa. Hmm, that was a close one uh the the vietnamese general he's like i'll do it myself next time i'm like why don't you just go over there and finish him right now He's yeah, probably like, like half deaf. <laughs> he should be anyway. Yeah. It's insane. Um, Chuck Norris surveys the carnage and thinks to himself, nothing, because Chuck Norris is just a vacant drone in this movie. <laughs> well, that's like, I feel like we, 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 we are harping on that quite enough because through all these like action scenes and s- the subterfuge, the sneaking around scenes, his facial expression is just, I said the word mannequin earlier, but that is a really great way to describe it because he just does not 
have any kind of facial expression whatsoever. Yeah. He doesn't look like he's ever in pain or he's exerting himself or he's even, he's not even pissed off. He just kind of like straight faces it the whole time. Yeah. I don't get it. I don't get why. I mean, he must've been just so dirt cheap. I I guess, you know, it wouldn't, what wouldn't surprise me is if Chuck Norris was so full of himself that he demanded that that's how his character should be like super stoic, nothing gets to him, nothing rattles him. He doesn't show pain when he's getting tortured. It, like it's kind of like uh Steven Seagal. It's just he's so boring. Yeah, because and yeah, they're, they're so boring because they try to be so tough all the time. And and con- compare and contrast that to uh John McClane in Die Hard. Yeah. Who is constantly getting injured and screaming and in constant pain and constantly pissed off. Like, and we, we talked, we talked about earlier, like that endears us to him way more than just some, some, you know, no emotion, badass who doesn't think or feel anything. I It's, Jeez. it's still, yeah, it, it's, it's really weird because a- after the carnage, we, Chuck Norris goes back to the whorehouse to get M Emmett Walsh who has two naked Thai women uh, laying on him. You get to see the, their butts. <laughs> and he seems Four really butts. excited. He's like emoting, right? Because he's seeing the butts. But for some reason, Chuck Norris just doesn't do anything. No, he's not like, this is one of the, that's another one of those things where like, he, he, he should be kind of like, oh, you crazy old man, like kind of like chuckling to himself or, or pissed off that he's wasting time. Just, Give us something, Chuck Norris. How are you feeling in this scene? Yeah, I don't know. We're never going to get that. And we do have multiple Chuck Norris films to get through. So now we can uh, (laughs) we can see if he ever does a moat. You know, yeah, I'm I'm kind of worried after this one. Like, have we seen all of what Chuck Norris has to offer from an actor standpoint at the like with just this movie? kind of afraid that we have i think this is the worst chuck norris film i've seen oh is it yeah Uh, well that's that's good then maybe maybe he comes into his own a little bit more we 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 can we we ring a little bit out of that that dirty dish rag that is chuck norris maybe next movie he he'll smile we're talking as if we're even done with this motherfucker there's still 41 (laughs) minutes left um (laughs) we're we're already sick of his stone face nonsense uh and after M. Emmett Walsh and Chuck Norris uh, regroup, we get the world's most boring chase scene that involves them getting to the boat uh, while they're on the docks. Chuck Norris is knocking Vietnamese people into the water and causing mayhem. I, I almost do believe James Hong at this point that Chuck Norris is a war criminal and should pay for his crimes <laughs> against the Vietnamese. Uh yeah, all these poor vendors and fishermen are just like, what the hell, man? That's my livelihood. Exactly. But because it's Chuck Norris, he has no issues and he gets into the boat. Nope. Nails it. And they 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 sail off to get back to Vietnam in which Chuck Norris gets back into his army fatigues and he has his headband kind of like Rambo. And uh-huh. uh, he he arms up to get the POWs, at which M. Emmett Walsh realizes that he needs to join Chuck Norris on this adventure, even though he was only hired to drive the boat. So they get into the little pontoon boat and they start oh. to sneak in Wait to a Vietnam. Second. Oh, go ahead. We missed something. Did we? During that boat scene, that's when the other bad oh, guy died. Shit, that's right. It happened so quick. Right. Okay, yeah. So, um, he the, the rewind. He uh, uh, Chuck Norris. He he. We see the chase scene. He gets onto the boat and he they 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 book it for Vietnam. Like right on their tail is the other big bad guy, and he gets into like like a motorized canoe or something like a really tiny little dinghy and and runs and like like boats after them. And then we get a scene overnight. Well, I guess they're I guess they're it's a long enough way to Vietnam. They're on they're on the the, the ship. And the the other big bad guy, the evil general from the past, jumps onto the boat, and then and Chuck Norris just kind of stabs him with his own knife. Yeah, and yeah. we're like, like you said, we're like maybe halfway, two thirds through the movie at this point, and the other big bad guy is already dead, and we got no one. It was 
it happened so quickly. I, I forgot about it. Yeah. It was probably like a minute scene. It was really quick. Yeah. Cause I actually, at this point I had rewound a little bit to, to rewatch a part earlier when they were talking to the arms dealers. And when I came back, I was like, ah, that's, that's roughly where I was in the, in like the little, little timeline of, of the, the HBO max player. And I like, Oh, I went like a little too far. And the scene was practically already over. He'd already like, he was already struggling with the big bad guy with the, his knife. I was like, what the heck did I just miss? Where did this guy come from? Yeah. Yeah. What a weird movie. What a, what a, what what a lazy movie. <laughs> like, I guess they just didn't want to have to find a way to get this big bad guy from Thailand to the POW camp, which is like where, you know, the final confrontation is going to happen. But these people, just, like, the, uh, Chuck Norris and M. Emmett Walsh are taking this fucking boat from Bangkok back to Vietnam, which is not a short distance. Uh, in fact, Jackie asked me <laughs> while we were watching the movie, she was like, <laughs> how close are they? And I was like, have you ever heard the podcast? Greg and I don't know fuck about geography. <laughs> um, in which she, she laughed and she was like, yeah, I noticed that. Um, but I looked it up. It, it's not a short distance, and yet they get there in the span of an afternoon. Yeah, like like one overnight trip. That's it. I mean, actually, okay. I'm I'm looking at the I'm looking at the map now. They have they would have to sail so far south past Cambodia, and then up and and I think they said they was in North Vietnam where the camp was. So like they're going way around that peninsula, up into the South China Sea. Like that's that's on a little stupid dinghy boat like that. It's got to be at least like a week's travel. It, it's yeah, uh, but time is mysterious. It's movie time. <laughs> maybe um, that's why we got that stupid shot of how fast the boat can go. Maybe so they're, they're just like going like warp speed over the water with that really awesome boat that we that he's got. Warp speed. <laughs> I wish this was Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> oh. But anyways, yes. So now we we still have around thirty minutes, and both of our main bad guys are dead. Yeah. So weird. Well, like, we like, all, all. I mean, we talk about how how little tension there is so far, but now that they're they're gone, like who is he? Like you know, there's there's no one left for him to fight except for faceless like no name henchmen. Exactly, and that's, and that's what, we get. what we get for 30 minutes um and we don't have to go beat by beat here because that's essentially what it is chuck norris and mm walsh they take their dinghy into uh vietnam where they come upon a vietnamese guy chuck norris starts fighting them hand to hand because they want to be stealthy because they're gonna save the pow's right of course yeah uh and he he's dispatching a few vietnamese people but mm walsh gets scared and he shoots one of them and he's like sorry chuck uh but it doesn't really matter because (laughs) there's only one other boat of vietnamese people and they just blow it up yeah with another one of those super grenades that chuck norris seems to carry with him exactly so now we finally get to what you think is the big set piece of the film which is chuck norris getting to the pow camp right Uh, i have to say the action here is pretty decent we see him sneak around he's planting c4 on different uh huts and different areas inside the uh the pow camp right and then you know the action kicks off as all the explosions are going off and then it starts to turn lazy again which is just chuck norris kind of just aimlessly walking around shooting vietnamese people yeah, like you say, that word lazy really sums up this because he doesn't really, he's not very kinetic in these shots. They just they just cut back and forth between him walking and shooting his machine gun and spraying it around aimlessly. Yeah. And then just kind of like interspersing that with guys, like Viet- random Vietnamese soldiers just kind of get, getting hit and then flopping around and, and dying. Just well, all no-name people. The setup was so good, and I thought they were going to do more with it, with the oh, C4, yeah. but they just blew all the C4 immediately. Right away. And it, I will, like you said, I will, uh, granted this, those explosions were awesome. They yes. were huge explosions. Uh, but it's, uh, it just, the payoff was just laziness. And at the end, after Chuck Norris is done slaughtering tons of Vietnamese people, 
<laughs> with zero effort spent. Uh, he goes to the, the prisoner section and he realizes as he's freeing people, they're all Vietnamese people. And one of the guys is like, yeah, they took all the Americans like three hours ago. Uh, <laughs> and then Chuck Norris runs off into the night. And one of the Vietnamese people goes, we'll fight for our freedom. Gather yeah. weapons in which nothing fucking happens with that. Yeah. Like that's so disappointing. I thought there was like, oh, that's a cool idea. Like they're going to, they're, they're pissed off and they want to go help the other POWs. Like they were. They were all in the same crap together and they want to go fight for him. And you would seem like, oh, they would team up with Chuck Norris and have like a little a little squad. He's going to have his own little personal army to kind of rush this camp with. Nope, it goes nowhere. Yep, it it was so freaking lazy. But Lazy, yeah. That, that's probably what it was. It's like, oh, like maybe the writer wrote that and they realized that it would be too hard or maybe chuck norris was too much of a prima donna to want to share screen time with other people he's like nah i'm gonna do it on myself yep either way Uh, so lazy such a missed opportunity and then as as easily as chuck norris got into the pow camp he finds the trucks that should be like three hours away but they're like right down the road did you? Oh yeah, that's a good point. They did say that, like, oh yeah, they left three hours ago, and he catches up to him in a minute. Yeah, it's it's insane, <laughs> insanely lazy. He got back in that warp speed dinghy, true, and, like compressed time, and then just like warped up to where they were. Ah, uh, exactly. N- now ensues, I guess, another just really by the books, super lazy action scene in which it involves Chuck Norris and M. Emmett Walsh in their dinghy going up and down the river shooting at cars the cars exploding cars shooting back at Chuck Norris and that kind of just happens for like five minutes uh, until a Vietnamese guy with a bazooka blows up the boat in which they're all celebrating. And I was kind of like, fuck yeah, they killed them. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah, like you see the three Vietnamese guys like laughing and celebrating. And in a weird way, you're kind of laughing along with them because, <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, the movie's up finally. But unfortunately, Chuck Norris comes out of the water, mows down oh. more Vietnamese people, but he does end up freeing the POWs. Uh, and then they, they steal a Jeep and they start driving away. And now like the entire Vietnamese army is on the tail of Chuck Norris, these POWs and M Emmett Walsh. And you're like, what are they going to do to get out of this situation? Yeah. They turn many people left. They turn left into a bush. (laughs) And (laughs) how did they, I mean, this movie is full of those kind of scenarios where like you think in the in the mind of the guards, like, how did you not see them? They were right over there. They're exactly. like right behind you or right above you. They just like, did they not see the car that was like 50 yards in front of them take a really like take a left into this obvious path cut in the, into the jungle? It was Whoa. so weird. They just went left. That's that's the grand plan when <laughs> uh Turn left. My you're, God. you're in trouble. You're a bad man. Turn left. Oh, some yeah. So, like so many of the like we keep throwing that word lazy around, but like that's so many of the action scenes in this only happen. They hinge on the fact that the guards are blind and deaf. Exactly. I don't. Because if they just seem like oh, oh, whoa, there they went. Shoot them. It's oh, what's even more confusing though. Is not the is the laziness of the action direction, but like so Chuck Norris turns left, he gets rid of the Vietnamese people, but then he booby traps the jeep. Right, he puts that grenade in there, <laughs> and then all of a sudden the <laughs> Vietnamese army is back. Like they were right going straight. Chuck Norris went left. They're going in opposite directions. Does this road like loop around somehow? <laughs> That's actually, I didn't even think about that. That's a good point. So like they, they take that left turn and okay, whatever that somehow got them to lose their, their people tracking them. But yeah, like how did they find them at that point? You think that they, okay, we lost them and now we can 
proceed safely to where the boat was. Yeah. But no, they just they find them and they're right on their tail immediately. It's super weird, right? That yeah, all of a I, sudden that they're there. Because the scene needs to happen, Phil. Because the because they need an explosion. Yes. Uh, in which they get. It's a really pretty explosion. Uh, so, yeah, the Jeep blows up. So do some Vietnamese people because that's what you pay money to see in a movie like yep. this. Super grenade, no problem. Uh, and now Chuck Norris and everyone is, they're trying to get to the big boat. And now they've found like a dinghy raft. So they went from the super raft to a dinghy raft. And they're all... <laughs> <laughs> They're all paddling to get to the superboat in which a nameless, faceless Vietnamese worker of M. Emmett Walsh is mowing down Vietnamese people left and right. Uh, that was awesome. I was, I was so worried for this guy's safety because he's like a one man guy, like one man army against all these dudes chasing him. It's like, oh, nothing, something bad is going to happen to this guy. Yes. And then out of nowhere, a superboat comes and this Vietnamese guy is just just shooting the shit out of this boat unfortunately though uh the vietnamese dude does die he gets wasted in which yeah. m emmett walsh goes i'll see you in hell and he I'll jumps in into hell. the water and he gets on the machine gun and starts shooting the super boat uh, i mean we, again th- such a lazy action scene because we we get more of what we got before where it's just like footage of someone holding down the trigger on a machine gun and spraying like haphazardly into the air yeah, and just cutting back and forth between that and random guys jumping off boats, falling off docks, getting shot, falling down. It's, it's so samey. It's not exciting. It isn't exciting, especially because at the moment that Ab Emmett Walsh gets onto the boat, the helicopter that you forgot Chuck Norris hired <laughs> arrives and it almost seems like at the same time the superboat and M. Emmett Walsh both blow up. Okay, I, I needed to ask you about that. I did not. How did M. Emmett Walsh's boat blow up? I, I feel like it, we just cut like they were shooting machine guns at each other, and then we just cut, and it's already in the process of exploding. What uh, happened? It, the ratio of dead Vietnamese to white people. Uh, was hit and they needed to kill a white dude <laughs> the the movie's like balance just kind of imploded <laughs> like, on itself joe zito is he's like sitting there with like a tally mark and he's like okay that's 1000 vietnamese we All need right, a blow it we need a dead white guy now sorry <laughs> m emmett um wait what yeah, exactly they actually killed him on set because you don't see you, while you see the explosion, you don't see the aftermath. You, M. Emmett Walsh doesn't get like a final moment, right? Like he's he's basically like a main character at this point, and he just the last we see of him is filler footage of him shooting the machine gun. It literally could be the same. They could shoot him for like ten seconds, and that could have been the two minutes of footage that they kept cutting up, uh, that they keep cutting back to. Yeah, you know. Uh, just different yeah. angles of him shooting at the same thing. How all all here all it would have taken was a quick like okay okay Emma, here stand at the machine gun like you're shooting it. We'll put the camera behind you. Okay, action now. Look look concerned and swing your head around and look at the camera. Okay, cut. That's all you need. You're put dead. that shot in right before the explosion. Yep. And that would be it. Like him him's like oh crap boom. Exactly. That's all. It's a two second shot. Uh, so <sighs> Chuck Norris and the POWs, they're in the helicopter. They're flying back to Saigon. And do you want to do you want to give it? Do you want to say it right now? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So this is this is this is where we get our quote of the week, which I, I'll, I'll preface this by saying this was a hard movie to get a quote of the week on because not only does Chuck Norris not really say anything, no one else really says anything interesting or funny or bad or weird either. I was thinking after watching this movie, I was like, what the fuck is Greg's quote going to (laughs) be? I was really worried because 
this this what were the, our quote of the week it came at the very end of the movie and i i almost didn't have one because i didn't i didn't have anything up to this point it's like nothing funny or weird is said like there's there's weird things that happen but it's all visual nothing that's said in the dialogue so thank god we get a hammy helicopter pilot coming in to save the day at the end both in the structure of the narrative and for our quote of the week he said he, he turns around in the, in the helicopter after they've taken off and he says to chuck norris he says all right where are we headed and chuck norris with no look on his face whatsoever he says saigon and this helicopter pilot gives the best delivery that i've ever seen he says oh shit I got. Oh shit! <laughs> As if he's like <laughs> wanted for murder or yeah. something. He is just so disappointed to have to go to Saigon. Oh and, shit! Oh shit! Like it, almost like a lazy thing. Like I don't want to fly that far. It's such a complex delivery that. I wanted like like so many interesting weird side characters in this, like James Hong and the bearded general and the arms dealer, and now this helicopter pilot. We get one great little scene with them, and then nothing. Yep. What so disappointing? But we got he came, he gave us a sweet quote, quote, and he got out. It's uh <laughs> oh shit. The the quote comes at the hour thirty six mark out of a hour forty one <laughs> movie. So that says something about Phew. slim pickings. Slim. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you noticed it too. Cause oh, there's, yeah. normally you probably have a guess of what my quote of the week is going to be because we're similar enough in that style that we'll, we'll key on the same goofy lines, but yeah, you like, there was nothing in this one. So again, thank God for this helicopter pilot. Yeah. Saved it. Uh, and James Hong has been quickly replaced by someone else. It doesn't really matter who, <laughs> Um, as Charles Bronson's helicopter with the POWs lands. Wait, 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 wait. You said Charles Bronson. Oh my God. <laughs> I wish. Um, as I'm, I'm back from Vietnam. That would be amazing if it was Charles Bronson. They they cast him as like the new Vietnamese general. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vietnamese now. <laughs> oh my God. Oh no, even even better if they just replaced Chuck Norris with Charles Bronson oh, and yes. didn't tell anyone and just tried to play it off like it's a totally normal thing. That's awesome. Chuck Norris got uh he got traveler's diarrhea. He had to he had to leave. <laughs> I would I would watch that movie. Um <laughs> Chuck Norris with Traveler's Diarrhea. <laughs> I, I think I think Char- <laughs> Charles Bronson and Chuck Norris have kind of like the same issue, but where they don't, they have like a hard time emoting when they're acting. But Charles Bronson is infinitely more interesting to watch. Oh yeah, I ac- I actually wrote that down too. Is like like there are kind of like the two main canon action movie headliners through this period, and Chuck. I mean Charles Bronson. He's he's already bottom of the barrel as far as like emotion, like you said. But Chuck Norris, he, you're right. He's just so much worth. You know, just he Charles Bronson is just like pure charisma by comparison. Yeah. He at least smiles in some movies. Jeez. This one's really weird. But as Chuck Norris's helicopter lands with the POWs, they rush into the state building. There's a lot of like tension for some reason in this moment. Uh, They're trying to get into the, the press conference. And it seems like they're trying to beat the new James Hong characters before they end the press conference, because if they, they bust in after it, the existence of POWs has less impact. <laughs> right. The, the, yeah, the tension here is kind of weird. Like what, cl- what ticking clock are they trying to race against? Like, I don't know. It's so weird. Fly, fly that helicopter to the airport, get these guys home. Why do you need to barge into a government building it where would, they're just likely to get rearrested. It would be different if, like, they told. I almost said Bronson again. If they told <laughs> Chuck Norris, you have to bring a proof of POWs back before this time. Then there's like a reason for the tension. Yeah, we we need to we need to establish that ticking clock so that we know what they're racing against and what the stakes are if they fail. Exactly, but there is none. 
but Char- nope. I almost said fucking Charles Bronson again. <laughs> he just just let it happen. It's 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 the natural course of <laughs> of where your brain wants us to go. I don't know why I'm thinking of Bronson <laughs> so much right now. As hey, I'm back. Chuck, I'm in the movie now. As Chuck Bronson <laughs> busts into the the room with a press conference going on, everyone kind of looks at him. Uh, how would you describe this part? He busts in. They see the POWs and he kind of gives like does, he gives like a thumbs up or something. And it I don't freeze I don't think frames. we get that. We I think he just he busts in, he he's he looks in the room and that freeze frames on him. But like it's they cut a couple seconds too early because the frame that they freeze on, Chuck Norris is looking in the room, but like all of the POWs are still getting like they're still like filing into the room, so they're still moving. They're like and they're like pushing past other guards. Yeah, there's like a whole there's a whole epilogue of this movie that we didn't get. It's it's really weird. They realized that it was already an hour and 40 minutes and it was 90 percent boring padding. And they just <laughs> uh, whatever. And it. people people are getting bored. They're going to leave the theater. I could I could see that. And that's how the movie ends. It ends in an awkward freeze frame. There's no actual yeah. resolution to the movie. Sure. Uh, Chuck gets the POWs and they're freed, but there's no like there's no after note or epilogue. No, the the lady who was with him at the beginning who came with the senator, the senator isn't there either. Like you'd think that they would be there. We would maybe get a scene or two of them in the middle of the movie. Like where like where is this guy? Like yeah. this Braddock, he disappeared. We gotta find him. We need to, you know. He said, oh, he said he was going to go find the POWs and maybe they're doing something diplomatically to sort of, hey, we need to get a press conference going to prove, you know, get these POWs on camera. And Braddock, we need you to get there. We need you to get these POWs on camera to prove it to the world. And we need you to get it here by tomorrow. And there's their ticking clock. And we, and we also established that the lady and the senator are still, you know, there and doing things. But we didn't get any of that. Yeah. It's so weird, right? Yeah. It, it's it's lazy, which is yeah. is interesting to say because the director Joe Zito, I I wouldn't. What he, else has he done? He doesn't make masterpieces, so I'm not going to put him on the pedestal here. Of like, oh my god, Joe Zito is such Action an amazing master. you know uh, director, but yeah. the movies that he has made aren't horrible uh he made friday the 13th part four which is like the one of the best friday the 13th movies is that um, the final final friday the final the final chapter <laughs> the not so yeah. final final chapter um he was the director of the prowler which i thought well, that, was that's right a pretty good movie with the prowler that's that's a um uh what's his name the special effects guy yeah I know who you're talking about. Oh my god, about. I'm I'm told why am I blanking he's on him? He's sex machine. Yeah, he's sex machine in in uh from Dust Till Dawn. Tom Savini. Oh my Tom Savini, thank you. Jeez, we're god, the dementia is strong in this episode. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're our brains are just pudding after watching Chuck Norris stare blankly at the camera for 90 plus minutes. So I mean, it's not like he makes horrible films, but this one was just so lazy. Yeah, though, like both of those two are are much more fun than this one. Yes, you know, could it have been? Could it have been intervention by Golan and Globus or like a budget thing? That like, they have oh, to they... hit this amount of um, time. That it has to have this. That it has to have that. I could yeah. see that. Yeah, like some some or some some kind of either that or some other kind of production related impediments that like oh like maybe the script was there but they just had the budget or they were over schedule and they're like just finish it and get it out um yeah, okay so i'm glad you said it oh this is a into trivia get it out into the fucking theater as fast as you can movie so mm-hmm. uh first blood comes out it's a big hit right 
yeah rambo it's stallone's next franchise they he's he proved that he can be an actor by being rocky and now he's gonna have his action franchise uh in rambo so obviously canon is like we need to have a rambo type film we need a rambo clone yeah and this film the concept of it was from the original treatment by james cameron for rambo first blood part two first blood part two the screenplay is by Sylvester stallone and james cameron in case you didn't know that interesting i did not know that huh. so the canon guys get a hold of this script treatment and read it and go this is what the next rambo film is going to be we got to fucking do this oh, get it crap. out we there rip this off get it out there ape on the you know the 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 damaged war veteran who's going to go back and get revenge yes because there was multiple times in this movie where i'm like this this is like rambo uh first blood part two but this came out before it and then i read that the script essentially or the idea of the script got leaked and that's That's so scummy yeah and they Um, ruined it too so they were so hard on getting this movie out before Mm -hmm. rambo first blood part two that greg they even got the fucking sequel out before rambo what so (laughs) missing in action yeah came out november 16th 1984 Okay. The sequel, Missing in Action 2, the beginning, which is a prequel to this one, came out <laughs> March 1st, 1985. Uh, that, that's what, what, like like four months? Yeah. And uh, change? Jesus. Did they actually produce? Okay, so, I mean, did they, did they do the first one and the second one back to back and then just release them staggered? Or did they actually, like, write, plan, produce, edit, no. All that crap in that in intervening four months. They made it back to back. Okay. Whew. What's interesting though is that Joe Zito isn't the director of both of them. What? Yeah. That is what. Okay. I'm I'm, I'm glad my instincts are right because I could I, I tell that something weird was going on behind the camera, and that is a really weird. So they they shot a movie and its prequel sequel back to back, same star, different directors. And oh, that's that is really. Are you weird. are you so ready for this? No, I'm not. <laughs> missing in action, the one that we just watched, mm-hmm. is actually missing. Missing in action two. Missing in action two. The beginning. What is the first one? So they filmed both movies. They looked at them and they went. The second one will make more money initially. Release that one. Call it missing in missing in action, and then take the sequel. Missing in action two. The beginning or missing in action. Call it missing in action to the beginning and release it as a prequel. That is absolutely batshit insane. Right? Why did they? Because because this one has more action in it, I guess. It yes. So on That's, a budget of geez. one and a half to three million dollars, the movie made twenty two million dollars. That's pretty good. Uh, bad return. Overwhelmingly negative reception from critics. Uh, yeah. Yeah but was the first com- first film uh, first commercial success for Chuck Norris <sighs> well that does not bode well for missing an action 2 then because if they thought that that one was so boring that they couldn't possibly release it as the first in a franchise how <laughs> uh oh we're yep. in for a bad time uh it's it's interesting to say the least that's for sure uh norris went on to say about the film one of the biggest thrills of my life came when i went to a theater to see missing in action and all the people stood up and applauded at the end that's when my character brings in pow's he's just rescued to a conference in saigon where the politicians are saying there aren't any more prisoners of war. Exactly. That's a very, and they all clapped moment. <laughs> and they all clapped and, and seen carried me out on their shoulders. Yeah. Um, Derek Adams of time out wrote that the film was so bad that it defies disbelief. It's xenophobic, xenophobic, <laughs> amateuristic, and extraordinarily dull. 
Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, it was definitely one of those action movie formulas, those B action movie formulas where you get you get some explosions in the beginning and you get some explosions at the end and there's a whole lot of nothing going on in the middle. Yeah. And that's pretty much what it was. It was a lot of those boring, like, I almost said Charles Bronson too. Jesus. <laughs> Charles Bronson, yeah, he's sneaking, he's sneaking around Vietnam and sneaking around Thailand, you know, doing slow kills with no effort. I mean, yeah, Dull, Dullsville, USA, for sure. It's it's something, that's for I mean, sure. It is the perfect encapsulation of what canon is turning into, which is, we heard that this movie is being made by someone else. We need to make it first and quicker. Yeah, just just they're 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 cashing in on whatever is hot. Like they they did it with Break In, they did it here, and I'm sure they'll do it again. They 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 did that with Alien Contamination off of the Alien success. Yeah, they're just they're making ripoffs. They're like they're like a a proto asylum. Yeah, exactly. Uh exactly which is kind of weird because like the movie it again like it didn't look cheap it just no everything else inside of it was cheap the action was cheap the acting besides M. Emmett walsh and james hong was cheap it was yeah that's a really good distinction it, it was aside from the sound which is dog shit and the soundtrack was dog shit but it looked technically competent. Yep. It, like the, the it looked nice. It was a, it was a good HD transfer that we saw. The explosions when they got when we got them they looked cool. Like we never saw any boom mics or camera shadows in the scene. It looked good. They just yeah, it's hard to put your finger on. It was just lazy otherwise. Characters who like started in the beginning of the movie didn't make it to the end or like and not even that they didn't make it to the end that they died. They just ceased to exist in the film anymore. Yeah. Like I said before, all those interesting side characters, James Hong, especially, but all the other ones, like all the interesting people were dispatched except for, I mean, the only one that really kind of made it to the end was uh old man boat captain, whatever his name was. I forgot, but, and he, he wasn't really that interesting. He was just slightly more, anyone's interesting compared to, to um chuck norris so yeah it's i mean I, I guess the only other good thing i can say about this movie is it was nice to see that they actually filmed on location and i think i mentioned it before like the the even though it was in the boring middle parts the part that the all the scenes in thailand when he got there like those were some of the where the weirder kind of interesting goofy things were happening but it was nice to see that they actually like shot what was clearly somewhere in Thailand they shot in the jungles of Southeast Asia. It, like you said, it, it looked, they, they spent money at least there. So it, it didn't look like a cheap set or it wasn't like, you know, somewhere in LA or something that they tried to make up look like a jungle. Yeah. It's uh, I, it, it seems like they shot it in the Philippines. So they did go overseas to, okay. to make the, the movie, right. They, they did some effort to make this movie look like a movie and like give it some type of realism. But boy, oh boy, was it just like a failure on a lot of levels, not every level, but a lot of them. Yeah. For an action movie. And it, I know we've said this before, but the worst you can be is boring. It's that, that, that rule goes doubly so for action movies. Yeah. And aside from, like I said, the, the beginning and the end, it was kind of, yeah, it was boring and hard to get through and i know i say this before the litmus test for me is how often i look at the timeline to see how much time is left (laughs) i did i did it a lot in this way especially in the middle so it failed that test i mean what what's your what would you give this out of five i mean this is a solid two okay that's what i would give it to i mean there's there's like for all the reasons we said it it was technically it looked kind of nice the action that we got was nice that will give it a two for me so did you enjoy uh, Jean Claude Van Damme in the film? Because he's in there. No, he's a soldier. No. Yeah. Yeah. So he went from a weird, overly excited bystander in Breakin to a random soldier in this. Yes. 
Oh my God, John Claude Van Damme. He is. <laughs> he trying so hard to get in those movies, buddy. You know, keep, keep camping out in Canon headquarters. Someone's got to do it. He's he's putting his dues in. Um, so <laughs> I'll be predator one day. Yeah. So eventually he can he can uh, become the blood sport, right? I'll be I'll be Guile in a Street Fighter movie one day. <laughs> You'll see. I'll be something. I'm gonna I'll make somebody. something of myself. <laughs> it, it it's definitely interesting because it, it seems like once you're in that canon family, they they keep you in their wheelhouse because I mean, essentially, that's what Jean Claude Van Damme is doing, right? He's yeah. he's doing these low level uh, things in in the hopes that eventually he does get the scrap from yeah he'll, he'll canon. Do break out yep. Which he does uh, eventually. He does Bloodsport, which is a canon yeah. film. When so. did when did Bloodsport come out? Nineteen eighty eight. Okay, so he geez, poor poor Jean Claude. He he's got he's got a couple more years to go before he uh he's he's got a couple more uh, soldier number five roles yeah. and in him before he gets to that. We're in nineteen eighty four, so we've got like fucking a thousand movies between here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Keep listening, folks. Uh, so I mean. After war, you really got to sit down, take a break, dance the pain away. And oh, of course, uh, well, we're going to walk down to Electric Boogaloo do, 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 do. as break into Electric Boogaloo Yay. is our next film. That's so I think we, we were hot off of Ninja 3 Domination, which I think like we talked about was one of the bigger more well-known cult classics that came out of canon during this time. And if that's maybe top three most recognizable, top five. Break into Electric Boogaloo for the subtitle alone has to be the most notorious, right? Yes. Oh, a hundred percent. Um, everyone knows it. In fact, I was just watching a movie and they made the electric boogaloo joke. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things like we talked about way back in our fir- in our in-, in our first episode. We were talking about you know what we knew of Canon before starting the podcast. And I think that was something that we both mentioned was the fact that the electric boogaloo as like a joke for a sequel subtitle is it's in like the public consciousness now, like use the force and all those other kind of movieisms that even people who haven't seen the movie, they, they will know and laugh at that joke. Yeah. It's crazy. Every, everyone knows it. Um, yeah. And it's also probably one of the biggest or bigger bombs. We saw the biggest, which was the Apple. The Apple, um, yeah, Jesus. This one definitely was, I think, a box office disappointment uh, for Canon, at least. But Break Into, Electric Boogaloo, the 1984 musical dance film, uh, reunites our heroes uh, seven months after its predecessor. So there was only a seven-month break between the first break-in and this one. And you can definitely tell at this point, you know, how many episodes has it been since we did that? I mean, it's been a couple. Like we're we're definitely as we move more and more into the Canon Golden years, we're compressing time. Like we're we're there's a lot of movies that are coming out yes. every year. I mean, we've been in 1984 for like five or six at least episodes. So oh yeah, oh yeah. And uh, let me take a look here really quick. I don't think we're gonna get out of it. Anytime soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we definitely have quite a few movies to go. Uh, break in two is about this. All three main dancers from break in are reunited and they struggle to stop the demolition of a community rec center by a developer who wants to build a shopping mall, which I kind of get that they uh, not knowing anything about this movie. I kind of get why they want to stop the rec center from being built, but this is the eighties malls are fucking awesome, especially eighties malls. <laughs> Just let it happen. I'm already rooting Peak against mall. you because I yeah. want malls. It's the 80s. I want that mall. I want the... How else are you going to get an Orange Julius? Exactly. On, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's our that's our next movie. Uh, you can watch it free, actually free, on Pluto TV and Tubi. It's there. Ooh, with ads. Oh. With ads. Yeah. It does say that it's on Hulu um and amazon prime with a subscription so i'm assuming that if you go to you know prime.amazon.com and you want to watch it there 
you'll be able to find lecture two electric to boogaloo break electric into to boogaloo. <laughs> electric boogaloo. boogaloo to boogaloo oh geez well greg do you have anything else no i think this i'm i'm, I'm very much looking forward to breaking two i think I, I was kind of cautiously optimistic about missing an action i think it it fell on its face a little bit for me but i've, I've got high hopes for breaking two and i've also got high hopes for the, the the myriad chuck norris sequels and you know action vehicles that we've got later so it can only get better from here i'll, it, I'll say that dangerous words to live by <laughs> dangerous words. oh man that's when the narrator comes in and says spoiler it didn't it's, well, I'll, I'll i'll remember to clip this out and uh play it before <laughs> every time you give a bad review here on it out. can only get better from here it didn't <laughs> Well, if you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. Leave us some constructive criticism. Send us an email at thatscanon at gmail.com. That's that canon, C-A-N-N-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow us on YouTube. That's canon there as well. And remember, since we said it, that's canon.